Good afternoon everyone. I'm Kate Washington. I'm the Shadow Minister for Early Childhood Education. I'm also the Shadow Minister for The Hunter and um, probably most importantly for me as the member for Port Stephens because if I don't have this role I don't have any others. Um, I'm just so grateful to the Independent Education Union for having invited me back again this year. Um, last year I enjoyed so much coming to the conference um, and I'm just so devastated that I'm not able to join you all today. Um, I have a confession to make. My, my confession is that I was successful in winning my netball semi-final and so unfortunately I'm playing netball probably as you're watching this and hopefully not hurting myself. So if that was if it was only an interest about me and it was only something that was that was mine, I would definitely be with you all today. But unfortunately, I have such a, a commitment to my team that I can't not be with them today, and um, and so I have I'm playing netball and I'm hoping that you're having a fantastic conference. Now. Um, I also want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where we meet, um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I particularly want to pay my respects to their elders past and present and any Aboriginal people who are in the room today. And I also really want to acknowledge the important role that elders play in shaping the lives and the young minds of their communities. And it's, I feel like it's a similar role to that which you all play each and every day in the services in which you, in which you work and um, own, operate, direct. I'm sure there's a whole range of you in the room today. So today I was, um, I'm going to, I perhaps, I'll start with a bit of a perspective. A perspective that I bring to most of the work that I do. Uh, but it, and it, it changes it, it changes in the details, but it doesn't necessarily change in its substance. So I thought I'd share with you one of the women that came to my office last week. She, uh, I'll call her Alison. Um, she had one of the most um, well, one of the most desperate cases that we've had walked through our door for a little while, and she is experiencing um, immense hardship. So she came with her 20 year old daughter and her two year old daughter. She has been living in, well I'll start, she, she'd experienced emotional, financial, physical abuse in her previous relationship. And she ended up physically turfed out of her home. And she was then homeless for a while and without her children. She then went to, um, was given home support in through Link to Home, a government agency that then organised for her um, what was known as short-term accommodation. That short-term accommodation has now been going on for two years. She does thankfully have two of her children now um, living with her in that short-term accommodation. but. She, it, it is only ever designed as short-term accommodation. It is well known in our area for not a pleasant place to be. And she's being exploited by, um, exploited by those around her and she's paying high bills for electricity, which we are now exploring, but you know, $100 a week for a small unit um, with small usage. The upshot is she's got so much going on. Her 20 year old daughter is having to work at McDonald's to pay for the family's bills. They can't really afford the nappies and the antidepressants they need to be able to stay healthy. So that's, that's the kind of people that come to my office and um, that are always high in my mind about how we have policy that supports people in that situation and the children that are, that are involved in that through no fault of their own and how we hopefully create policy and settings that are more supportive so that people like Alison and her family aren't in that situation in the first place. So I'll come back to Alison towards the end. Um, 
So I was admiring of the uh, theme of today's conference, which is the, the, the myth, myth busters challenging the things we know are wrong. So I'm sure that there's been a lot of myths challenged and busted today already, but I've got to just talk about a few of the obvious ones as well, um, because I, I assume that you all understand that you're all babysitters. And, uh, and because that's what a recent Australian senator has said, and it seems to be a fairly, uh, let's say, a prevalent view amongst policy makers and media. Um, so it's something that just absolutely needs to be busted because if there's anything else that we all know is how important your role is and how important it is for the children and the families that your role is properly valued and that they as prof as the professionals that you are and as the passionate educators and teachers of our future generation there's no more important role really and for people to still be having those outdated ridiculous views is just quite obscene um, the other one that I just wanted to talk about is workforce participation. So there seems to be this overall view from policymakers and a broader community that um, because you're only by, you know, babysitting units, then you're really only there for workforce participation purposes. And as you all know, there's a fairly important thing missing in that equation, and it's a very little thing, and it's called the children. So the role that you play is more, it's more focused on, on the children than the families, but the policy makers seem to have this um, greater focus on ensuring that there is greater workforce participation. And of course that is a worthy goal and it is needed for our economy. But equally, what we are doing with the children that are the, the preschoolers of today is as equally, if not more important for our economy in the future. Because if they're not accessing that all important early education at such an early stage and preparing them for school and preparing them for lifelong learning and for outcomes, improved outcomes over their entire lifetime, if we are not doing that, we are doing them a disservice and we're doing our future economy a service, a disservice. So there, there has to be in this conversation about the early childhood education and care sector, that there has to be those, those twin goals of assisting women particularly to increase their participation in the workforce. But we cannot ever, ever forget how important the children are in that equation and that their future is really where the focus ought to be. And I know it is your focus each and every day when you're at work. Um, so, uh, there's a few um, hot topics around at the moment that I thought I'd touch on since we, since we I last spoke at the conference and, and have met with a number of you um, at your services since then as well. Um, but there's a, a few hot topics like um, Start Strong and the, that new rollout of preschool funding. Um, I want, also want to talk about special needs funding. Um, the new requirement, mandatory requirement for attending professional um, information and assessment uh, training. And, a, and I quickly touch on a new SEP that's just been introduced by the state government as well. So in terms of the Start Strong funding that many of you would be very, very familiar with because you've probably all had to turn yourselves inside out and gain actuarial degrees to understand what it is that you're actually trying to implement. Um, the, as, as you would all well know, it is really complex uh, and the, it's the, the nature of the, the funding and the ticker box exercise that you have to undertake um, has been an enormous challenge to the sector and I know that many of you have changed the way that your services are operating, um, extending hours to ensure that you've got um, children only there for the two days because good, goodness knows if they get three days then you'll get punished for it. Um, so the, the complexity is a real concern. The, Another issue that's raised regularly with me is the delayed uh, census data collection and the fact that, that that impacts on your funding but in a delayed sense so that 
the funding that you, on any given year that you receive, doesn't necessarily reflect the children that you have at that time. So if you've got additional special needs students, you're not going to get the funding for that because your census data from the previous year didn't have those students in there. So there's, it's, that's, that makes it a, a very challenging in terms of a business sense because, and I, I think that's another thing that's missed in the whole, whole equation of the work that you do, that you are running small businesses each and every day. And to have uh, you know, that lack of certainty or funding that doesn't reflect what's actually happening on the ground makes it very difficult to run a business. Um, so the other concern with the, the Start Strong is the, is the ticker box nature of it. So you've got, you've extended your hours, your students are then ostensibly there for the two days. Are they there for the whole 15 hours? Because that's the whole government's goal is to get the children there for 15 hours, um, at least, well, well, only 15 hours um, before in the year before school. So if they are there for those two days, then you've ticked that box. Are they actually staying for those extended hours? I'm getting varied opinions as to whether that's the case. So it's, it's the government's created an environment where the emphasis is on making sure that they are getting their federal funding without the focus being on the, on the children as to whether they are accessing the all important early ed that they need for the, for that, um, the dosage that, that is widely reported as being the necessary dosage. So there's a question mark as to whether that's actually being achieved. The boxes are no doubt being ticked, but is it actually delivering the early, the preschooling education that it's meant to be delivering? That's a question that, that remains unanswered for me. Um, and and I'm, I'm no doubt that you'd be able to answer it much better than, than I can. Um, we've got, so the sector is, in terms of the preschooling, we're still sitting way behind in the state in terms of funding. We're still, last year I, I, I talked to you about a 365 million um, shortfall in the budget. Well, the budgets, the budget, budgeted monies that have not been spent. So monies have now come in through the Start Strong funding model, but those monies still, compared to other states and territories, do not reflect the value that should be placed on the sector. So in New South Wales, we're currently spending about 2.9% of the education budget. In other states and territories, it's double that, if, if not more. So there is, there is a, um, an issue still in terms of our fees are still higher than any other state and territory. Our participation rates are still lower than every other state and territory, and that's because our funding is less than every other state and territory. So there is still a lot to be done in terms of increasing participation and increasing affordability. Um, the other issue that I'm concerned about is special needs funding. You might have extended your hours during the day, but there's been no additional uh, resources or funding put towards um, children with special needs. I understand there's complexities in that space now with NDIS um, and individualised funding and that being available in some areas but not all areas yet. So that's a, a space I'm very interested to hear from people about. Um, because what I'm hearing is that largely the funding has not been adequate for many years and that a lot of you are going into your budgets to be able to top up the funding that you know that those children need, to be able to provide the supports that they need. So if, if we're having struggles with trying to get fees lower for families, then we can't have a situation where you're continually having to eat into your bottom line to be able to support children that need it. So that's that's something I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing from, from you about. Um, 